Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Fog by James Herbert. So this is his second novel after The Rats. This is the second book I've read of his after The Rats. Possibly one of the only times in my lifetime I've read an author's books in order, and it was purely by accident. Dane reads. Uh, I had heard of this before from something else. I think it was mentioned in Stephen King in, um, what's it, in um, Dance Macabre, where he was writing about one of the scenes in this that we'll get to. Um, we don't, we do have a blurb, I guess, of sorts. So I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'll go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the peaceful life of a village in Wiltshire is suddenly shattered by a disaster which strikes without reason or explanation, leaving behind it a trail of misery and horror. A yawning, bottomless crack spreads through the earth, out of which creeps a fog that resembles no other. Whatever it is, it must be controlled. For wherever it goes, it leaves behind a trail of disaster as hideous as the tragedy that marked its entry into the world. The fog, quite simply, drives people insane. Remember with fear. So, we have a foreword here, which I want to read. And I just think this is a great little, um, great little introduction to the time this was released. So it says, The fog made me a lot of enemies. Fortunately, it also made me a lot of friends. It was first published in 1975, written in 1974, when spy stories and historical romances were the vogue. In the United States, William Peter Blatty had made his definitive mark with the movie of The Exorcist, and word was going around about an interesting new writer by the name of Stephen King. In England, a new kind of horror tale involving mutant rats on the loose in London's East End, a story that held scant regard for conventional moderation in its depiction of violence and the consequences, had created something of a stir. It was a book that, literally you might say, went straight for the jugular. The Rats was my first attempt at a novel, The Fog was my second. And he basically talks about how he was tempted to, in his words, ameliorate it, to improve it, uh, when he was going back to prepare this edition, but he resisted the temptation. And I'm, I'm glad he did, you know? We get a great quote here. Yes, he'd learned a lesson himself today. The unknown was always more fearful than the reality. And then we get uh, the Reverend Martin Hurdle. He's preparing himself for a Sunday morning service, and uh, but he's been exposed to the fog, so we get, the service began as normal, pleasurable to some, boring to others, but today, because of the tragedy, meaningful for most. A few people near the front noticed the vicar occasionally put his hand to his forehead as though he were tired or had a headache, but the service continued smoothly enough. They sat and looked up at him when he climbed the steps to his pulpit, anxious to be comforted by his words in their time of sadness. He looked down at their upturned expectant faces, eyes focused on him, eager for him to speak. Then the Reverend Martin Hurdle, vicar of St Augustine's for 18 years, lifted his cassock, undid his trousers, took out his penis, and urinated over his congregation. And then this here was reminiscent for me of my novel Meat, which is set on a factory farm, and actually I have been getting the vibe of reading James Herbert. I'm like, man, I should have been reading this guy years ago. I think, if anything, I, I take more away from his writing style than from, say, Stephen King's. Like, I don't attempt to be a Stephen King or whatever in my writing. But uh, Herbert is similar enough to my own writing style, I think, that there are a lot of lessons I could pick up from him. So I, I really should have read him ten years ago, you know. But anyway, uh, this guy is getting attacked by some cows. He began to scream as he received more kicks. They seemed to be taking it in turns to run forward and lash out at him. One kick caught him full in the face, breaking his nose, blinding him for a few seconds. When he could see once more, it was like opening his eyes to a bad dream. The cows were racing round him, their eyes bulging almost out of their sockets, froth and slime running from their mouths. They trampled over him. If he rose, they crushed him with their bodies. They used their heads to knock him off his knees. They began to bite him, snapping off his fingers as he raised his arms to protect himself. A scream ended in a gurgling, choking noise as a kick broke his jaw and blood that ran down his throat. When at last he lay sprawled semi-conscious on the muddied grass, they heard it together and crushed the life from his battered body with their hooves. This little bit about no, not knowing if you're capable of love is something that I relate to because I don't know if I am, you know, but anyway. And this is foreshadowing what happens with these characters later on, and this is a very important character. Holman had tried to get Casey, her real name was Christine, but he had invented the nickname for reasons he hadn't told her of yet, to leave her father's house and get a flat of her own. This she would have done had he allowed her to live with him, but there he'd drawn the line. After two previous disastrous affairs, he had resolved never to become too entangled with one person again. He had been near to it many times and even proposed marriage once, but the girl backed out because she knew, and realised she had always known, that he didn't love her. That had been years before, and now he wondered if he were really capable of love. He had gradually lost most of his cynicism on that topic during the months he had known Casey. He still resisted, but guessed he was fighting a losing battle. Maybe he was getting old, resigning himself to the fact he needed a companion, that although he'd never been quite alone, he hadn't shared for a long, long time. And so we get this, this is, um, you know, the guy's job is to go and inspect where the military had been active, 
and um, this is what we get when you get some evidence that the military might be behind the fog. The fog, the fog. Keep thinking the mist. Do you realise the trouble you could be in, the department could be in, if it was discovered we held photographs of secret military installations? But what was the point of going down there? To take photographs, yes, but not to be used by us. I merely wanted proof for myself so that I knew there was rich land being wasted, acres of arable soil, beauty spots, so that I was in a stronger position to argue that the area should be given back to us. My God, we could be put away for years for the sort of photographs you took. And here we get a little bit about gay sex in the army, so... He thought back to the old days, to the huge army installation at Aldershot, the rough training ground for thousands of raw recruits. There had been tension in the air in those days. The war was in its third year. Every week more and more soldiers were being shipped abroad, and each week they seemed younger, less experienced. Hodges was a corporal in the cookhouse and was content to idle away the war as such. He knew of Captain Summers, had heard the rumours about him, sniggered with his cronies each time they saw the thin, waspish figure march by, saluting but wriggling their little fingers at him when he had passed. But Summers hadn't been the only one. In a camp that size and with so many raw young men, homosexuality was not too unusual. It was sneered at, true, despised by most, but many had secretly indulged in its illicit pleasure. Hodges had even tried it himself once, but found it painful and too much like bloody hard work for his liking. The rumoured bromide in the tea didn't seem to do much good. He used to chuckle to himself when on night duty at the thought of all those pricks raised secretly towards the stars, pumped by thousands of hands all over the camp. And then the uh, old sergeant major um, becomes a teacher and, and a few bits here. He felt no yearning towards the young boys he taught or attraction to the young men he came in contact with, although he still liked to be around them. The sight of youthful bodies no longer stirred him, but he could appreciate their beauty, like a man without sense of smell could continue to appreciate the sight of a rose. And then later on we get, um, he often did a quick tour of the school in his free period, feeling it was his duty as deputy head to make a regular inspection of the classes while lessons were in progress, even visiting the empty dormitories to ensure the boys had left them neat and tiny. Beds made, side lockers carefully packed. Many a boy had been punished for leaving a discarded sock under a bed. He secretly enjoyed going through their lockers, seeking out pornographic photographs or books, various items that could be confiscated, even sniffing at dirty handkerchiefs for signs of masturbation. That is weird. <laughs> So here we get uh, this little bit, which is one of the brutal scenes that I wanted to read out. Captain Hook, said Hodges aloud. All eyes turned towards him. Even Summers stopped his squirming to look. He walked forward, brandishing the large garden shears, snapping them open and shut. Captain Hook, Captain Hook, he repeated over and over again as he walked towards the helpless figure. An evil grin spread across his features. Summers also smiled as Hodges stood before him, saliva running from his mouth. His breath came in short, sharp heaves as he looked expectantly at the odd job man. Hodge's eyes travelled down the bare torso before him until they reached the huge, swollen penis. He grasped it with one hand and chuckled throatily, his laugh becoming insanely loud. Summers grinned back at him, his head nodding in a seemingly meaningless gesture. Hodges released the throbbing member and slowly raised the shears that it was between the two sharp blades. Yes, yes, Summers cried, his old body now quivering with excitement. The boys watched in silence as the two blades snapped together and the scream echoed around the gymnasium. Mmm, bye bye penis. And we get chapter 8 starts with Herbert Brown was worried about his pigeons. And you can tell how he's gonna die, can't you? But uh, just in case you can't, here is a little excerpt. The bird's head suddenly shot forward and its beak pecked at Herbert's bleary eye. He screamed out in pain and fell back among the perches, releasing his grip on his pet bird. The whole hut erupted into a whirlwind of screeching, fluttering bodies as the birds flew at him from all sides. He raised his arms to protect his face, but they pecked at his hands viciously, causing thin trickles of blood to run down them. He swiped at them wildly, sending their frail bodies crashing into the sides of the coop, several falling to the floor again, unable to rise, feebly fluttering their broken wings in a useless attempt to reach him. But still the others continued their attack, flapping their wings at his head, pecking at his crouched body, finding exposed flesh, drawing tiny dots of blood. Suddenly, part in rage, part in panic, Herbert grabbed at one of the feathered bodies and, with a cry of anguish, crushed its tiny bones with his hands. But the movement had left his face exposed and three of the pigeons immediately flew at it, one clinging to his neck, the other two striking at his cheeks and eyes. He was already half blinded and now felt his other eye pop as he released the dead bird and tried to protect his face again. The shock forced him to his feet, thrashing out violently, smashing the birds to the ground, crushing them with his feet as he staggered blindly towards a small doorway. But in the turmoil, in the confusion of flying bodies, beating wings, the shrieks of the birds, his own cries of fear, his pain, he had lost all sense of direction and crashed into the side of the hut, knocking himself to the ground. And it just gets worse for him from there. And then we get this. This is one of the most uh, vivid scenes in my imagination as I was reading it. 
At around six o'clock this morning, virtually the entire population of Bournemouth left their homes and walked into the sea in a mass suicide attempt. Silence filled the room. At last, Holmer managed to say, it's impossible. Impossible, yes, but it has happened. Over 148,820 people, and that's not counting the thousands that were on holiday there. Men, women, children, all drowned. They're still trying to drag those who couldn't reach the sea back from the beach. Pool Harbour is just crammed with floating bodies. The shores around Bournemouth are littered with corpses. Barrow, who had been quiet up to now, spoke. What about the fog, sir? Has it been sighted? I've issued instructions to locate it, but naturally the local towns have enough on their minds without worrying about fog. I couldn't give them the reason yet without causing a large-scale panic. I have to see the commissioner before I do that. But one thing I did learn, Bournemouth was covered in a thick blanket of fog yesterday. And then the fog starts to move towards London. And they learn that there's like a nucleus to this fog, which may be sentient, so we get... Holman had discussed with Riker the fact that the mutated mycoplasma had been trapped inside the cathedral, or had it taken shelter? Was it feasible? Was it remotely possible that the mutation had some sort of driving force? Could it have... Holman had hesitated to say it. Could it have intelligence? After all, it was a parasite that fed on the brain. Professor Riker had laughed, but it was without humour. Every living thing has some driving force, Mr. Holman. Even plant life has some intelligence. It's a matter of degree. But to suggest this organism has a will, a brain, it has a motivation for survival, perhaps, just as a flower reaches towards the sun, but a mind of its own. No, Mr. Holman, don't let your harrowing experience this morning send you into the realms of fantasy. The mycoplasma does not control the fog. When the wind took the protective cloud away, the mycoplasma had to go too, trapped in its centre, caged by its own protection. It exercised no power over its cloak of fog. It gives no direction. It is a mindless organic thing, incapable of action by thought. But action by instinct? Holman had interrupted. Yes, perhaps. Maybe it amounts to the same thing. And then again, another little indication. You know what's going to happen here from the start. Irina Bidmead always rose early. At 73, her days were too short to be wasted on slumber. And her cats would be hungry. And yes, she gets eaten by the cats. It's great. So here we get... Oh, it's Irma, Bid... Irma Bidmead, sorry. And she says, Irma Bidmead, the old woman who had loved cats yet sold their bodies for vivisection, was already dead. The cat she had fed and housed still gnawed away at her cold flesh mixed with bits of material from the garments she had worn. They had clawed and scratched at her eyes first, then when she had been blinded and weakened, they had sat on her face and smothered her. When her feeble struggles had ceased, they had begun to eat her. Now they were full, eating out of greed, not hunger, but later they would go out and seek younger, more tender flesh. It wouldn't be hard to find. So that's about all I want to share with you from the fog. I don't want to get too many spoilers or anything like that. Uh, as I say, I really enjoy the way that James Herbert writes uh, and I think it's going to in inspire me and influence my writing moving forward. In particular, the way he writes, it just feels like a kind of almost a neutral report of a situation which actually makes it feel more realistic and more believable. Um, and I like the way he just covers things from start to finish. It's very similar to um, how I approach like, novels of mine, like Formerly and even my uh, horror novella, No Rest for the Wicked where it kind of starts at the start of the phenomena, ends at the end, um, which doesn't always happen, you know, because quite often you'll read a book and you're already well into it, and, you know, I just I just think Herbert does it really well. So I gave this a four out of five, a strong four out of five, and I can't wait to read more James Herbert. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Fog by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.